Hello. And today we'll begin chapter one of Heart of Amethyst. That dream again uh, comes back from time to time, making me remember that dreadful night. The night I lost everything. I can remember it as if it was yesterday. The pain, the sadness, the despair. The sky looks oddly similar to the one I woke up to the morning after the attack. Even the birds are chirping in a similar manner. Or maybe I'm just overthinking it. Either way, there is no use dwelling in the past. I have an errand to run, and I'm already late. Better get going, or else that geezer will give me an earful. I stand up from my not so comfortable sleeping spot, which is in the middle of a grass patch. Jeez, my back hurts a lot. I shouldn't have slept on the floor. I look back at the spot I was lying in. A little, a little me said has fallen forming in the grass. Proof that I've been sleeping there for quite a while. I then turn my gaze towards an impressive royal castle. I'm currently on the main road of the market district. The castle is standing beautifully in the distance. This path is quite important as it connects the higher part of the city, also known as the home of the jerks, with the lower part of it, also known as the poor nest. The royalty in their castle, bust of assholes if you ask me. Watch it, kid. Move out the damn road. While being distracted, an old man bumps into me and curses me while doing so. Sorry. I say bad, but he just hustles and leaves in a hurry. I'll blame him for being mean. The street isn't is that big. I'm just standing like an idiot looking at the castle. I take a last glance at him and then turn around to begin walking alongside the others. The streets are crowded as per usual. This is the capital after all. Look around, you can see many people carrying heavy looking bags. Most of them must be farmers trying to sell their goods. The land of us canines is very rich. Sadly, on the other hand, we have the city politics that pretty much make it impossible to run a decent establishment in the city. So I would say the best option is, not, is to not be in the city. Any small village would do. Trust me on that one. You don't want to be stuck here more than necessary. What are you doing? Stopping my cabbages. I hear a screaming and upon close inspection, I can see two guards taking it taking it out on a metal aged fella. They are dismantling his selling post. The poor dude probably didn't know the, that street selling is forbidden. He's most likely an outsider. Nay, please stop. He yells at the two of them as he tries to make them stop, but they don't flinch a bit. Instead, he's now on the ground with a bleeding nose because the guard hit him with his blade's handle. He has a certain accent, thus confirming my theory that he's not from around here. I feel sorry for him, but there's nothing I can do. There I intervene, and I'll end up just like him or worse. It's more trouble than it's worth. Besides, we all learn to deal with the city guards. One way or another, this would never... This would happen eventually. Welcome to the Agony. After a while, I decided to ignore them and, and carry on. My mood ruined by that miserable display. It doesn't take me long to retrieve the old man's order of meat. We were running low in the stock, so I had to pick some. I paid ten silver Andres coins for it. A little expensive, but meat has always been expensive. I always thought it was rather curious that the currency of a canine empire was called Andres. Now it's obvious that it comes from Andres, but however came up with that idea wasn't very creative. As I walk back, I don't see the cabbage do anymore. He probably picked whatever he could and left. The guards most likely confiscated the cabbages. I can already picture the scene in my head. They're supposed to protect us, but all they do is use their power to terrorize the people. Things have been 
in a very bad state for the past 12 years. Those wits bastards do whatever they want at the expenses of the old and useless king, including creating a stupid law against straight selling, worthless pieces of scum. I'm sorry, noticing how useless it is for me to be getting this worked up, it's not like I can do anything about it. I'm like I wasn't here the first two years of this. The old man talks about the many riots that started 12 years ago. Sick got ugly real fast and that the guards have the authority to tell whom whomever they see fit as it is royal decree. I decided to drop the topic and just keep walking. I'm not that far away from our stop. I'm back. Sorry for taking so long. I just a stop and yell as hard as I can. He won't admit. He won't admit it, but he's clearly losing his hearing. Soon then, Mr. Biscotti walks into the room. He's still the same good old Biscotti. He hasn't changed much these past years. The old man's built like a ox at the wall. Check it out, now, boy. Welcome back. He welcomes me with a warm smile. His clothes are a little dirty and dusty. He's been likely we're raising and cleaning up the shop, and most importantly, the back room. Do you bring what I asked this time, or will I be stacking wheat instead of the meat? The old man begins to laugh hysterically. Poor guy thinks he's funny. Yeah, yeah, that's just happened once. Besides, potato, tomato, not really a difference. He waves his eyebrow, is suspecting that I actually brought wheat. But as I place a bag of meat on the counter, he smiles back at me. I'm not that stupid, you know. Never said you were. Still, you're not denying it. He said nothing to that, which makes me wonder if he actually thinks I'm that dumb. Either way, I decide to take off my cloak and place it on top of my desk, which is quite the mess, I must say. What took you so long? You didn't run into any troubles, did you? I had to fight off five guards that were terrorizing a poor helpless man. I strike a heroic pose, trying to portrait myself as some part, as some sort of savior. Really now, how come you, you're not injured? Because I'm a really good fighter. I shrug. Ellie, what really happened? He puts on his fatherly face once again, clearly worried about my well-being. Why don't you believe my story? Because I taught you better. I smile back at him, trying to ease his worries. Now I'm fine. I just took a little nap by the side of the road. No biggie. If you need to take a nap, why not use your bed? When the grass looked fairly comfortable, don't blame me. And it did, but I guess I was wrong because now I have an aching pain in my lower half of my back. Whatever am I going to do with you, boy? You need to take the situation more seriously. What if you get? He stops on his tracks to find the right way to proceed with that sentence, but he gives up. But he gives it up eventually as there was no way to salvage that. This turned to be a really uncomfortable situation. So I decided to cut him some snack and apologize, though, to get our work double for something so silly. Like I know what you're going to say, but I'll be fine. Sorry for worrying you. I'll try not to let it happen again. He smiles at that and walks towards me and waiting myself for a hug, opening my arms wide. But instead I receive a punch on the back that makes me jump in pain. What gives, old man? You seem in pain, just trying to help you. He mysteriously smiles back at me as he takes the meat with him and locks himself up in the back room. I want to place the impact, trying to get rid of the pain. Said this was, this will leave a bruise. Probably. Need anything else? No need, kiddo. Just do your own thing for the rest of the day. I smile at that. It's always a good thing to have time for myself, although, to be honest, there's not much to do. I don't have many friends, not anymore at least, and the store looks clear enough so I don't have to do that. So what shall I do? I think hard for a second trying to figure out what to do. 
Books seem like a good activity, not the most entertaining one, but I'll make it do. I take a look at the bookshelf, one in my hand, through, the, my, through all my options for this afternoon. We own a decent amount of books, and I've read most of them, except for My Biggest Enemy, The World's Encyclopedia. I've never managed to finish this book. All the dates, fast, and important events just mix up in my head, making it hurt after 40 minutes of reading. Give or take, depends on my mood. Well, maybe today will be the day. Might as well give this whole thing a try. So I sit near the window, placing the heavy book on my lap. Over 100 pages, most of those are filled with dates and general knowledge. We were pretty lucky to have this sort of book. Most people don't see it, but knowledge is really important in this world. I sound like the old man already, but it's true. You learn to value it when you travel as much as, as we used to. Anyway, I'm getting out of track. I need to focus on else. I will never defeat this phone. The title reads Encyclopedia of the World and a Sense of Resume, Volume 2, by Callus the Twelfth, Grandmaster of the Royal Library. Well, that's a mouthful. I haven't even started. Despite that, my will is strong today, so I, I pick a random section of the book and dive right in. After the goddesses created the world and the three races of it, the 200 years passed before they decided to bless us with their magnificent gifts, which made the survival rate go up. Ironically enough, just 500 years after those were given, the divine plan backfired, the birds from the north decided to colonize the rest of the land. Killing the neighboring tribes as they saw fit. This world, this would situate us in the year 3700 prior to Andrus, approximately. The world was initiated with the invasion of the birds on feline territory. The felines, who by that time populated, populated the plains of the east, were cast away, relegating them to the east desert. The deadliest wasteland you can ever imagine. No crops can grow in such a place in the wet and the water is quite scarce. If more information about the wasteland is needed, please check the flora and fauna section of this volume. The horrible condition that the felines found themselves in made them migrate further east, where they discovered the virgin island of Athenia, making it their new home. This process took over 1,000 years approximately. Even then, some feline tribes decided to stay in the continent and live in the desert, creating the first scarce of tribes, which we, which we shall discuss in the following volumes. Track, tracing back to the bird conflict as the felines migrated east, they continued their relentless expansion on the mountain section of the continent, setting their eyes on the south, seeking to cast away the canines as well. By that time, the canine tribes were quite sparse, so against the growing empire other birds we didn't stand a, stand much of a chance. They killed thousands and thousands and enslaved even more. Luckily for us, the mountains and, and forests proved to be a safe haven, allowing a few to escape there. This status remained for over a thousand and two hundred years, meaning that by the time the felines had finally set in thin air, the canines were being secluded to the icy mountains of the west. Well, this wouldn't last because as the birds thought their victory was secured, a civil war ignited between the two opposing political bands. More information will be presented in the following volumes. The Canines used this opportunity to take the capital of the Burr Empire, burning it to the ground, and freeing the comrades that were being held as slaves. This event took place in the year 1950 prior to Andrus. See, I'm going to start there. So many dates, wars, and whatnot are making my hair hurt a little. Although, that last date, that the Canine Empire technically started in the year 1950 prior to Andrus, and we're currently sitting at the year 567 after Andrus, that means that, uh, that our society has over 2,500 years in the making. This can seem like a lot, but considering that the whole continent was stuck at war for the most, at war for the first 2,000 years. Besides, there's one more thing: the fact that the apostle is never mentioned in any history book that makes, in the history book makes me curious. 
I don't know if my mom made up that story or if it just went lost with time because pretty much nobody knows about the existence of the guy. And the church makes it look like Andreas was the sole savior of the world as he stopped the whole war by himself. Anyway, enough for today. What else is there to do? As I gaze towards the shop's counter, I can see my old internary book sitting by the side. The old man must have been looking at it while I was gone. Well, this really takes me back. I had totally forgot this thing existed. This is a diary Mr. Biscotti gave me for my first birthday with him. He used to record all the trips we made after he adopted me. That was a few years back. We pretty much went everywhere. I opened the first page and read the way I had named it as a child. Oh, to a secret mission to find my sister and go back to the forest and be happy again by Ellie Biscotti. Oh wow, I really used to be a silly kid. This was the first time that I used his last name as my own, though. When I lived with mom and dad, we didn't have one, but so Mr. Miscotti thought it would be a good thing to give me this. See, that old man has really done a lot of things for me, huh? I flipped through the pages and them I described the many twists and plans we came up with trying to find Mary. We pretty much swept through the whole canine territory looking for her. There was no luck, though. Not a single person had heard about a young white vixen with purple marks on her body. We eventually stopped searching as we had no more leads to where they could have been, to where they could have taken her. The conclusion we reached was that she must be somewhere in the heart of the city the only unreasonable place for us. The memory of my little sister comes back to me at full speed. She's probably a teenager now, and I, as I haven't seen her in 10 years. I haven't given up, I promise. I say to myself, trying not to think too hard on this, she's fine, I will find her no matter what. I continue checking the diary, tucking the final page between my fingers, there's a cute drawing of two wolves holding my little self by each of my hands. One's obviously the old man. The other, I miss you tons, Miss Scotty. I'm sure he does too. I search the drawing with my fingertips, remembering the good times. She died two years ago from an unknown disease. And it's just the things, it's just then things have been complicated. We don't sell as much anymore as it was her charisma that brought people in. Besides, Mr. Biscotti is not the best merchant because his math and selling skills are really bad. He's good at finding better stuff, but when it comes to bargaining, he's lucky he has me, and I'm lucky that she taught me everything she knew. It's thanks to her that I actually know how to read and have a decent education. Well, that's enough sampleness for one day. Hey, because she saw me like this, she would be the one, she would be the first one to hit me square in the head with a book. I wipe my tears away real quick, which makes the sadness slowly go away. Now it's my turn to take care of the old man. I need to be strong. For both of us. I won't let you down. I place the diary back where I found it, ready to do something else. Well, what else is there to do? Should I really do that now? I feel like it will take me the rest of the afternoon to finish up. I may be able to do something else for us. Do it anyway. This is by far my least favorite activity, but I might as well use the free time to sort out my mess. I sit on the chair, taking a look at the insides of the drawers. There's a bunch of old papers and receipts that I figure I should check before throwing them away. So as boring as it sounds, I must do this myself because the old man isn't the best at keeping track of numbers and money. So yeah, here we go. Fun times. The afternoon goes by rather quickly. I just finished checking all the papers stuck in my desk. I wrote down 
all the important data and then threw away all the rest. I leaned back on the chair and sighed. This was supposed to be my free time and I ended up wasting it with work. And take a look at outside, there's still a few stragglers finishing up their day. The sun setting, filling up the room with a nice and melancholic orange light. You okay there, boy? Mrs. Biscardi exits the back room. Looks like he's been polishing all the metal artifacts we own. Hopefully, they'll sell soon. Yeah, sure. I just finished sorting out our money issues. We really need to sell some stuff if we don't want to start next month. And stand up from the chair, reaching his eye level. Which his eye level. Or trying to. I'm still on the lower side of the male population. I'll figure something out. Don't worry, kiddo. Where's my eyebrow? Not really sure if I can trust this newfound confidence of his. Talk about sorting things out. Your birthday is coming up next week. Anything special you want? Oh, I totally forgot. Is it really that time of the year? Well, I really, I'm really getting old. I mean, I'm, I'm just turning 21. I feel like I'm 40 already. I started feeling the burden of the year suddenly weighing on my shoulders. It's been 10 years since I left that forest. What have I really accomplished? By my book, I've just been a nuisance to the pair that took care of me. What is that long phase for? Having second thoughts about becoming an adult? My ears perk up as I notice that I've just been staring into nothing this for a while. You must have read me like a book. The man is really good at that. Or maybe I'm just that easy to read. No, it's not that. I'm, I'm not sure if I really want a gift. You're giving me so much that, and it just seems a little unfair. I lie. He doesn't need to know my inner turmoils. It's better if I deal with them myself. Nonsense. You're my kid. You don't have a gift, so make your mind up soon or else I'll pick it myself. It makes it sound like a bad thing, to be honest. Mr. Piscotti is really good at making gifts. It is, a, it is as if he knew exactly what I wanted just by looking at my face. I'll give it some thought. Face, old man. He passed my back and then climbs up the stairs to his room. His heavy footsteps make it sound like the wood will break, but this house has been around for generations, so I doubt that'll happen. I should hit the bed myself. I'm spent. I take a last glance at my desk. Everything seems in order. Except for buried among some old papers I which I must throw away tomorrow. There's an old rusty metal. I grab it and spread in it. It's an old emblem that I ripped off from that bastard's cloak. It brings back bad memories. That's why I stored it in the drawer. I don't have, I don't like having it around, but it's true that this is the only lead that I have left as to, as to where my little sis could be. I grip it hard to leave him the marks of the, of the metal on my paws. Thinking about them makes my blood boil. To be honest, I don't know what this thing is or what the symbol means. No person that I've asked has given me answers. Maybe I should take it with me again, just in case. With that in mind, I store the emblem in my pocket. Then blew off the candles and head to bed. There's someone knocking at my window. It's so late at night. Okay, yes, I hear you. This better be good. I open up the window, the wooden window, take a look outside. There I see a dark figure standing in the middle of, of the street. It's giving me a signal by reflecting beams of moonlight onto his dagger. A code that I know far too well, outside knowing that I have no other option than to check what he mean what he wants. I know this idiot. He must need something. So I close the window, put on my cloak and exit the, and exit my room. I make sure to walk slowly, making the wood under my feet crack at as least as, as possible. I wouldn't know how to explain this to the old man, so it's better if he doesn't notice at all.
What do you want, Pat? I was sleeping. The figure steps out of the darkness, revealing a very tiny-looking jackal. An old friend of mine, you could say. Yeah, no shit. He had to knock like 20 times. I started clearly frustrated as I was woken up this late at night. My sleeping schedule is often a mess, and for once... What are you doing here anyway? I told you guys I'm not interested in going back to the game. Those days are over. The little jackal is looking around as if he was doing something sketchy. Wouldn't surprise me, Pat and the others are always up to no good. Stealing, pickpocketing, vandalizing, among other things. That's what they do. Yeah, yeah, I know, but you have to trust me, right? This time we have a, a huge deal, and Hugo wants you there personally. I know you're the best at picking, picking locks. I hope knowing that is true, but I'm tired of hearing him talk. You guys always have an excuse to ask me back, but like always, my answer is still no. Night, Pat. But wait. I'm about to turn around, but the jackal grabs my cloak and stops me from leaving. He looks kind of desperate. I'm trying to give him a little more of my time. Not sure why, I just did. I'm telling you, White, you don't want to turn down this offer. Hugo has been really patient with you because of the past you guys shared. You don't want to ruin that, do you? Is that a threat? I grab him by the collar, lifting him a few inches off the ground. I also frown and growl, trying to look as intimidated as possible. You're a few inches away from being able to threaten me, Pat. I, I know why. I didn't mean me like that. Like the little guy is shaking. He's always been a coward, the type of sketchy fella that would rather let others fight for him. But he really needs help with this one. I'm telling you, it's big. I drop him, I drop him as I raise my eyebrow. Normally Hugo isn't this insistent, but something feels off tonight, which piques my curiosity. Talk. I say coldly, but ever since, but ever so the jackal was, smiles happily. I knew you would come around, White. Right? Hugo will be happy to see you. I haven't agreed to do anything yet. Talk, Pat, before I lose my temper. The little guy squirms around, clearly shaken by the threat. He takes a few steps back from me and then clears his throat. So, um, you know the king, right? Obviously not. Oh, oh yes, dumb question. Point to tomorrow, Mr. King is finally running away with his tail tucked between his ass. A reliable source told us that tomorrow multiple carriages will reach the port at noon. With the king among them, of course, but most importantly, many of his riches. Wait, are you guys planning to? Yes, we'll steal from the king himself. We'll be rich, right? Freaking rich, I tell you. This is big indeed. It's risky, but these guys know how to make a distraction, which means that I will be free to check the kills myself. But it is really, but is it really worth it? What if I get caught? I don't want to go to the cells again. Seeing Mrs. Biscotti expressing as he saw me in the dungeon at that time was heartbreaking enough. That being the real reason why I left the gang in the first place. But still, with that much go, we could live the rest of our lives without needing to worry about a thing. Meaning that I could focus on the search of my sister while giving him the life he deserves. So, you in right? His voice makes me jump as I as I was deep in thought. Balancing the good with his with the bad, I think this is worth a shot. It may actually be the last chance I get at earning good money. Tell Hugo I'll be there, but make sure you tell him that he better not bail on me again. Well, this time I will whip his balls off for sure. Understood? I knew we could count on you, partner. See you tomorrow. The jackal nods a few times before setting off into the darkness. I want some vanish in front of me. He may be weak, but he still knows how to vanish. Once I make sure he's far away, I lean on a wall and then lie on the floor. I look up to the sky and sigh, not sure if I took the right decision. But there's no turning back now. I have to commit to this. So they better have a good plan.
the next morning comes up real fast. I didn't get much sleep, though, because my mind kept racing back and forth, thinking about the decisions I took yesterday. I can't help but wonder if I was it. Mrs. Biscotti gave me breakfast and tried to chat with me, but I'm far too distracted to put up a decent conversation. Hey boy, you okay? Seems like your head is in the clouds today. That snaps me out of it. I tried to feign a smile, but, the, but he knows me far too well to fall for that. I didn't get much sleep last night, that's all. Something on your mind. Gee, am I that obvious? You could say that, yeah. I'm just, um, not ready to be grown up. I tried to come up, come up with something on the spot. He has no reason to doubt me, so I hope he buys it. Well, it has its ups and downs, but you'll get through it. You're a really smart boy. Oh yeah, thanks. Really, is that all you got? Come on, Ellie, come up with something else. Oh, I was thinking. I still haven't decided on a gift yet, so I'll, so I'll do that today if that's okay. Don't worry, I'll just be out for a while after lunch. Need anything from the central market? He places his hand on his chin and looks up, probably trying to remember if he needs anything. Eventually, he denies with, with his head. Not at all. You do your thing. Be careful, okay? Thanks. We didn't do much for the rest of the day. But when it was time for me to leave, the guilt in my gut almost ate me alive. Because when he saw me leave, he smiled. Now I'm standing in the promised alley, waiting for Pat to show up. Soon enough, I see the little jackless figure down the street. He enters the alley, trying not to look suspicious. So, I ask, feeling the palms of my hands sweating like crazy. It's been a few months since I did this, and I don't feel ready at all. Hugo and the others are in place already. We'll just wait until the characters arrive. They'll make sure to create a nice explosive distraction. Then it'll be just you and me, like old times. I hope for that last comment. Hugo may be a sketchy guy and a big jerk, but at least he has some sort of honor. Pat, on the other hand, I wouldn't bet a single Andres on him. Even my life depended on it. Relax, White. After we steal from the king, we'll be swimming in gold. So, what's the signal? Oh, trust me. You'll know. Just wait for the Big Bang. May just poke up at that. Does that mean Hugo's using his fire magic again? Oh, Hugo use fire magic again. Is he crazy? Don't worry, White. He won't. This time, our provider made a deal with a merchant from the east. And you know what they say. Cats made the best explosives. He winks and giggles back at me, not really calming me down. The opposite, really. Well, at least that idiot won't be using magic. Although, what sort of benefactor did these guys get this time? If they bought from the felines themselves, they must be wealthy. No use beating around the bus, need to focus. Okay then, we need to climb this roof so we can see them coming. After you then. I move to the side and allow him to try to jump onto the wall. The little jackal tries to climb the wall. But his legs won't even reach, making me chuckle at the sad sight in front of me. He hurts a noisy poor fellow. Can't help but be tiny. I kind of understand his pain. I'm not the tallest man around, so I decided to not be a jerk and help him out. Here, give me your foot. I squat, placing my back to the wall as I join my hands, together giving the little guy a stepping place. Can we not talk about this? My lips are sealed. Time passes and I begin to have my doubts. Whether their source isn't reliable and it just play them. Wouldn't be the first time these idiots got scanned by a reliable source. I remember the time when a guy told us that there was a secret gold mine outside of the city skirts. 
It tells me that we needed to pay them 10 gold coins. I did say it sounded dumb, but Hugo thought it was worth a shot. Turned out to be walks. I gazed into the distance, feeling sleepy all of a sudden. We've been waiting in this room for a while, and nothing has happened. Tired of waiting, I stood up, stretching my now sore muscles. Seems like you guys got scammed again. I'll head home. Wait, you can't leave. The sun's already setting, Pat. We've been here for hours. I'm not spending another second flying myself on this roof. But, but I knew that I shouldn't have trusted them, but a part of me really wanted this to be. I stop at my tracks as I hear the sound of horses approaching. Ray, are those really? Get down. Pat dressed me down, making me lay on my ass. Shit, it hurts. I have no time to, to complain, as in the distance I can see three big and luxurious looking carriages. See, I told you this was the real deal. Now let's get ready. We lay down as close to the roof as possible, trying not to let the guards see us. According to their source, our target is, is the last carriage, the vault. The first one is the most guarded one, as there are five guards around it. The second and third have only two guards surrounding them, which makes obvious where the king's at. The first two cars pass by us, and as the third one comes in front of us, cover your ears. What? Before I even acknowledge what's happening, there's a big explosion in a building a few houses ahead of us. It was really big, bigger than anything I've ever seen. As my senses finally come to, I can listen to the people running around, scared for their lives. The smoke fills the streets quickly. The darkest smoke I have ever seen and the smell is really strong. Did the cats really make this? Oh shit, they're missing. I almost forgot. But looking around, I spot Pat running towards the vault already. I follow suit and get down from the roof as well. Most of the guards are guarding the king's car or running around like idiots trying to find a culprit. This gives us the perfect chance of reach the vault unnoticed. Okay, work your magic right. I'll keep watch. Alright, gotcha. But make sure to keep watch. He nods as I get on my knee, for easy as access to the padlock. Once in position, I take out the, the lock pick. I close my eyes as I insert the device into the keyhole. All the noise makes it difficult to focus, but I have to make do. I bought their annoying screens and focus on my own heartbeat. I carefully move the lock pick around, making sure the noise any little noise or any sudden halts to my device any sudden halts that my device comes to. The first gear takes takes me some time, but I eventually manage to break it. From there, the second one breaks easily. Yet the third. Hello, right, will ya? Shut your mouth, Pat. These things take time. He goes, making sure not to make a single noise. And while I appreciate that, I will appreciate breaking his nose even more. But that's besides the point. Either way, I close my eyes again. Come on, just two more and we're done. You can do it, Ellie. There you go, the third one is finally broken. See that jerk put on a world fight. Come on, baby. Just one left. I can do this for sure. There, four. Pay I got. Something extremely heavy hits me. Sending me flying across the street. I swear that I heard my bones cracking. I hope to be wrong. I try to regain my strength, but I can't breathe and my limbs feel numb. My hair is spinning and everything is blurry. I can hardly see a thing. Just shapes one ahead. When I rouse. What the hell it hit me? Don't move what? As I was trying to my hardest to stand up, a second hit to the, to the gut surrenders me to the ground. I puke a little, feeling my inside suffer from the sudden pain. My mysterious attacker pins me under him, making it impossible for me to, to escape. See, this dancer is heavy. I feel him like I can't even lift a finger. What is he? A bloody bear? Put out that fire and make sure the king is safe. His voice is strong and carries a lot of power. 
is even a little scary. I can't really, I can't really see who is he is talking to. All I can barely do is hear pieces of what the others are saying, but nothing is clear. Damn, my head hurts like hell. And you, stand on your feet. I'm taking you with me, rat. He grabs both of my hands and places them back, and places them behind my back, and it forces me up. Left me as if I were a mere feather. I go out at the pain and try to break free, but he has an iron grip. It's hopeless. I've been caught. Again. Slowly, my vision comes to. I turn my head around, finally catching a glimpse of the scary looking wolf man that has been keeping me captive. He is a big black wolf. At least a head taller than me and pretty much a mass of muscles, which I can easily notice under his heavy looking armor. He has a few scars on his face, a face that gives off a certain aura of authority and power. An overall scary looking knight. Looking around, there's not a single person on the street anymore. They must have all fled because of the explosion. While the screens quieted down, all I can hear is the snap of, of the fire. A sudden flow of guilt runs down my spine as I finally notice how much damage we did. We messed up real bad. Oh, of course. And of course the what the is gone. An overall scary looking night. Look around there's not a single person on the street anymore. They must have all fled because of the explosion. With the screens quieted down, all I can hear is the snapping of the fire. A sudden flow of guilt runs down my spine. As I finally noticed how much damage we did, we messed up real bad. And of course, I'm the idiot that gets caught. I'll kill past, swear it. Please do, let go. I didn't mean quiet. Speak another word, and I'll cut off, I'll cut your head clean off. He, he can't do that, can he? I sick him up again. He has a claymore attached to his back, which is not surprising because he probably has the strength to swing that thing as if it was a mere toy. That sight makes me go, as, as I know that he's not just bluffing. He can kill me easily with that thing. I frantically tried to break free from him, but the wolf wasn't letting me, wasn't letting me go any time soon. Try me. He whispers to my ear, making me, making my blood run dry. Not only that, but he also managed to unsheathe his blade with only his free hand. I'm screwed. He held me there for a while until the sun had almost disappeared into the horizon. He never got tired or even moved an inch. He just commanded the other knights and waited. The fire has been put out and the other guards are dispersing the curious ones that wanted to get a glimpse of what was happening. Captain, everything has been taken care of. One of the many guys that has been running around approaches us bowing in front of my character. I guess this jerk is a big deal. Well done. Go back to your post. The knight nods and walks away as quick as he came, not saying a word and never looking back. Now there's only one thing left to do. I quickly find myself being forced to the ground. The big wolf hit the back of my leg, giving me no other option but to kneel. I'll execute you right here. That ought to teach your buddies a lesson. He gets his sword ready. One swift strike from there and I'm done. Am I done? Am I really going to die here? But please, don't do it. I will stay still if I were you. Or else I might not cut your hair properly. His voice is cold. He's really going to do this. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Biscotti. Suddenly, the door of the front carriage opens and a very old-looking fella steps out of it. He's wearing a very expensive-looking suit and looks as if he would break at any given moment. I've heard rumors that the king is over nine years old, but seeing, but seeing it this close, your majesty, please remain on the court. Everything is being taken care of. 
Well, if everything is being taken care of, then I don't see why this old wolf can't stretch out his legs a little. The big man grumbles but says nothing else. Meanwhile, the king turns his gaze to me. Or I think he does. I can't tell for sure because of the hair covering his face. Much closer as he is clearly expecting me. Then his eyes land on mine. He stares at them for a full minute, his face turning sour as if he just saw a ghost. This is honestly a little embarrassing. By the goddesses. Sir Roderick, who is this boy? He's a mere street rat, your highness. He'll be executed on the spot as a lesson to the others who will most likely be watching this. The mention of my execution makes me tear up a little. No, I don't want to die. Please don't. Quiet. Don't you dare speak in front of the king. At ease, Sir Roderick. No one needs to die, especially not such a young soul. That seems to set him up for good. He didn't let go of me, though. A guy can dream. Here, child, stand up. The king kindly helps me back on my feet. Of course, I'm still stuck on Roderick's grasp, but it's better than being on the floor for sure. He never stops looking at me as if I were in a, in a unique animal that he just found. Heavens, it's really you. Right now? I say back, but, but I clearly irritated Roderick as he holds me tighter and hits from the immense pain. Sir Roderick, please, do not hurt this child. But sir, he's a mere sweet rat. He tried to steal from you. And it's highly likely that he and his companions ignited the fire. Yes, that seems to be the case, but I must have a chat with this child. So get him ready, Sir Roderick. We shall take him with us to Rose Island. That statement leaves both Roderick and I speechless. Neither of us knows how to respond to what the king just said. He says nothing about that. Lost in thought as he stares into my, my leaves. Are you certain that's a good idea? You don't know this kid, and he's a criminal. He finally snaps out of it. Meanwhile, I remain quiet throughout the whole interaction between the two of them. Clearly traveling to that fort is better than to be executed in the middle of the street. But what would that do to me once we're there? Sir Roderick, don't make me repeat myself. He shall accompany us to the fortress. I'll leave you in charge of the security as per usual. The king speaks with a commanding voice, quite impressive for an old man, because he managed to set up the night. After that, he just vanishes back into the carriage, leaving me at the mercy of the wolf. You're lucky the king has such a great heart, you little rat. Now, go to sleep. But the last thing that I saw before losing consciousness was his mighty fist hitting my face. After that, nothing comes to mind. Just darkness. I don't dream. I don't feel. I don't think. Just darkness. I've never seen anything like this before. Is someone there? Where is it? I can faintly hear some voices. I'm not fully conscious yet, so I, so I can't say for sure, but they both sound like males. These marks are not normal. They're not tattoos of any sort, and I can sense a faint magic, a faint ancient magic coming from them. Besides his iris, it's purple. Purple? Are you sure you check properly? That's impossible. I know what I saw. Check for yourself if you don't believe me. There's a momentary silence I, and then I feel a gentle touch. He presses his paw against my face, but then moves it away. Nah, I believe you. Better not to wake the sleeping beauty. That book is awful. You should read something better than that. Said touch suddenly moves to my chest and then my torso. Do you think they reach? Further down? You mean the marks? Yeah, they do. They're engraved throughout his whole white side. Meaning that he has them on his dick too? There's a sudden awkward silence. What about the goddesses? You checked his dick, didn't you? Uh, of course, I, I did, you idiot. The king asked me to run a whole checkup on him. Well, how did it look? I'm not telling you that. Okay, yeah, I think I'm done this conversation. Time to wake up. Slowly but steadily, I will gain my vision. I can see two men standing by the end of the bed I'm laying on. 
The room itself looked extremely fancy, and I must admit that I feel really tempted to keep pretending to be asleep, just to be able to lay on this bed for longer. They haven't noticed that I've opened my eyes already, so I could probably pull it off. But there's no real point to do that. I need to know what the hell is going on. I'm trying to stand up, even if all the muscles of my body bear me not to. Oh, you're awake. Careful now, mate. And the brown wolf walks closer, greeting me with a smile. His voice is sweet and calming, saying for his overall behavior. Besides, his face is void of any malice as he kneels beside me. Try not to move, mate. You got a very bad head injury. He's right, you should try to rest while you can. The other guy spoke. His voice is colder and monotone, as if he was a speaking corpse. Who are you? Name is Alban. That guy over there is Achilles. Where, where am I? As I ask that, the two of them exchange a worried look, but soon after return their gaze to me. Do you recall what happened? Some details are fuzzy, but I can clearly remember how, what happened before Jerdrick hit me in the face. Talking about my face, I can't feel it. It's so numb that I don't feel anything at all. It seems that you can at least remember the hit. But I'll ask again. You remember what happened? I, I, dang it, I'm freaking out. What the heck happened to my face? What did they do? Now, now, give him a break, will ya? He got his ass beat pretty bad. Relax, mate. Your face feels numb because of the medicine we use. So try to relax, okay? I um, thank you. He smiles back at me, making my cheeks feel a little warm. I'm not sure which one of these two make it, make me feel the most uneasy. The extremely cold one, over. The really cold one or the over-caring other. Alban moves a few steps back, giving me enough space to try my footing. I can't at least, but after a few tries, I managed to stay up. I tried to steal the cargo, and I got my ass beaten. I can't see Keller's off guard by answering his question, and he says nothing in response for a brief moment. The weird-looking fox nods as he writes something down on a piece of paper. A real silence fills the room with almonds, gracefully breaks it. So? So what, Evan? Will he be okay? He's got no brain damage. His face will take a few days to, f to fully heal, but aside from that, nothing major. Any broken bones? I ask as, as I feel a stinging pain on my right side. I can still remember clearly how hard I hit the ground when I was first punched. That guy really has a strong fist. Now luckily, but I can understand why you would feel pain, Roger mentioned that he kicked you quite hard, so if you have problems breathing, let me know at once. So, so it was a kick, good to know. Still thinking back, to, still thinking back ahead, I really had it coming. I said I never trusted those guys again. They always find a way to get me in trouble, and I'm dumb enough to fall for it. Wait, you didn't answer my first question, where am I? Sorry about that, we needed to check if you remember anything. We're on Laguna Fortress, Rose Island. So it was true, but why would the king bring me here? Laguna Fortress is a castle built a few centuries ago. It's situated in the middle of the Great Lake in Rose Island which is not far from Yagnir. In few words, this is the world to his second castle. I'm sure he'll explain it to you. Don't worry, mate. Talking about that, we should let Wadsworth know that our guest is awake. The king wants to meet with him after all. The mere memory of that black wolf makes me sever. I was hoping to never see him again. Well, it is kind of like wouldn't it be better to wait until the mall? How long was I out? Just about the moon position, it's past midnight. Past midnight? 
That means I've been here for at least six hours. Mrs. Piscotti must be worried sick. See, I need to go back to town. There's someone important to me there. You're not going anywhere, what? The black wolf, wolf enters the room suddenly. It seems as if he was listening to the conversation and waited for the perfect time to make his entrance. Can he walk? His tone of voice seems rather irritated. Can't help but wonder why. He barely can. Maybe the, maybe try not hitting the king's guest next time. He should be a prisoner if you ask me. Doesn't matter. Get yourself decent what? The king wishes to speak to you. He moves a little closer to me, into his hand to grab my wrist. Luckily for me, Armin intervenes and forces the knight to take a few steps back. What do you think you're what do you think you are doing? What do you think you are doing? His response is aggressive and forceful, but the tinier wolf doesn't move an inch, keeping it in a neutral face at all time. He needs some time. We should wait outside while he gets changed. He gives me a quick, soft smile, then turns around and opens the door for the other two, clearly signaling them to step outside. Agilus shrugs and exits the door, but Wadsworth sends me a last, nasty look before walking away himself. As for Alma, he lingers for a while, clearly wanting to say something. So, um, your clothes. He points to a box under the bed where my shirt and cloak have been neatly folded. Please don't take long. See ya. As he steps out, he closes the door behind him. Silence soon fills the room. I stand there by myself, not entirely sure how to feel about this whole situation. It's just crazy to think that I would ever be standing in a place like this, but rather than a dream come true, this feels more like a nightmare. Goddesses, what did I get myself into? I walk closer to the boss and kneel down beside it. Soon enough, a floral scent hit my nose. Seems like they washed it. I take the shirt and put it on. My cloak is inside the box as well, but I don't think I'll be needing it. I then look around the room. Everything just looks expensive and shiny, even the material that's not supposed to sign does. The whole place is filled with luxurious decorations and furniture. And let's not forget about the bed. I felt like I was sleeping on a cloud. Hurry up, what? I hear Roger yelling from the other side of the door. I sigh, feeling unsure if I should actually go out there or just jump through the window. I take a glance outside in case there is an option, but my hopes are soon shot down. I'm currently very far away from the ground. I'm on a, on a tower, a very tall one at that. So, with that option out of the way, I waited myself to open the door. My palms are sweating and I can notice how my breathing is speeding up. I'm diving into the unknown, and I'm scared. Please, Mom, protect me. I say to myself, finally grabbing the handle and opening the door. So the markings on Ellie that caught Almond and Iglas' attention is clearly, clearly strange to them. And when the king got out of his carriage, right after that explosion, he saw Ellie, he said that it seemed like he found somebody, like, oh, it's him. Like, there's something about Ellie that he's been trying to look for. So, what is it about Ellie that makes him so special that the king would take him to his castle? And plus, you know, back in the prologue when those bandits targeted his mother and their home burned to the ground, I think, I think there's something about Ellie and his family that a lot of people are targeting them for, so I don't know, but there's something about 
Ellie here that the king wants or or that he's trying to look for. So I don't think Ellie's gonna get in that big of a trouble. But again, um, I only watched the the entire VN so far, so I know everything that happens. But it it doesn't look like he's going to get imprisoned or executed anyway. So we'll have to see what happens next time and what the king wants from Ellie. So. Thank you all very much for watching. Goodbye.